Thank you, Elliot. I'm really stoked for my message, too. Whatever that means. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of First John, chapter 2, as we continue in our series, Springtime for uh, Your Soul. And um, this is a powerful passage, and it's going to sting a little bit, because when you hear God's truth, it applies to everyone. And People always come and say, man, that sermon just applied to me. Well, it's nothing that the preacher does. It's the power of God's word. And um, this one I've named, I was talking to Ray, my son-in-law, and trying to contextualize the message. If you haven't noticed, one of the strengths of this new generation is that they uh, contextualize within the culture everything. So they might quote from the Bible, and they might quote from Shakespeare, and then they quote from Homer Simpson or The Family Guy or something like that. And Ray's really good at that, and so I was brainstorming uh, this sermon series, and he had the idea, Game of Thrones. And because that's what this really is, is Christ winning the Game of Thrones. And so he's like a, a critical analyst for Game of Thrones. He publishes online, actually, uh, what's going on. And so he started to kind of tell me everything in, about it. And, and his mom was there, and his sister, and his uh, niece, and nephew, and Jackie, and, and we had a big family lunch and his mom said what's game of thrones because her mom doesn't his mom doesn't watch much tv and she's a very conservative uh spanish speaking christian and so um ray said um don't don't mind my mom he said my mom uh, doesn't watch game of thrones because there's not enough nudity in it for her <laughs> and then she's really aghast he always teases everyone and um but anyway we came to the idea of talking about Game of Thrones and um, who's on the throne of our life. And this passage, when you read it, 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 it stings. It's like when you go to the, the dentist and they say, this is going to sting. And I always say, well, give me laughing gas and give me three shots and hit me over the head with the two-by-four then because it more than stings when they're working on my mouth. But this, that's the way it is when you read God's Word. So this is the New Living Translation. This is what it says. It's a bit confusing at first, but when there seems to be a confusion in Scripture, it usually hides an incredible truth that will bless our lives. It says the New Living Translation, Do not love this world. And it's, Do not agape, of the four choices for love, this uh, cosmos, nor the thing it offers you. For when you love the world... You do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Now, John has um, uh, the Gospel of John, which he wrote as a young man, telling the story of Jesus in a very, very profound way that's reached many people for Jesus Christ. And then he has later on in his life, as an old man, a reflection of the same thing. So in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loves this world. It's a very famous verse. Everyone knows that verse? It was always my dream to be the guy in the end zone of the Super Bowl, dressed in a crazy outfit, that holds up the sign, John 3.16. And I had that chance the first time the Seahawks were ever in the Super Bowl. And I went as a guest of Jeff Dunn, and, and he was at a neurological conference, and he came back, and he said, why don't you go over to um, Fred Meyer and buy us a bunch of uh, Seahawks stuff? So I bought makeup, uh, wigs for us, and everything. And when I, I had mine all on, and I just put my makeup on in just a completely scary way. And I said, how do I look, Jeff? And he said, a little bit scary. <laughs> but I was on NFL action when I went to the Super Bowl, and I did get my picture taken as the guy that, the crazy guy that does John 3.16. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world. The word for love is agape. The word for world is cosmos. So in one earlier time, John's saying, God loves this world. And then another time, he's speaking personally to Christians in their lives, this ever-important message when he says, don't love the world, or you're not a Christian. Now, in that contrast is a powerful truth. When God created the world, 
in the uh, Genesis, which is translated into Greek before the time of Christ in the Septuagint, it uses for world, it says cosmos, the same word. And God, after he creates the universe or cosmos, he says it's good. Now John's saying it's bad. So it seems like an apparent contradiction, but in it is the source and the power and the insight for you to be who God meant you to be. And you're going to have to stand up, and it's going to be difficult, and you're going to walk against the current. But we love the world. We look at the world and we think, wow, birds. I love puppy dogs and kitty cats. I love people. I love Harley Davidson motorcycles, and someday I hope to get one. Jackie doesn't want us to get one, but I'm lobbying her now uh, for that day. And um, I, love, I love this world. I love the people of this world. But I can't love it too much. It all depends on who you put on the throne of your life. This morning when I, I was checking on the Internet, um, one of the kids who used to be in my youth group, who isn't a kid any longer, but I was a youth pastor when I was 18 years old for 10 years. And... Uh, he said, one of the life-changing points of my life was when my youth pastor, Pastor Tim White, set us all down because we had a huge youth group, and he drew a circle and he said, one of the most important decisions, and he put a throne in there, is who, are you, who and what are you going to have on the throne of your life? Now, for me, that was my uh, testimony. But I said, you can have good things, but put them too important. You can have your marriage on the throne of your life, and you don't have any other resource of love, and it doesn't work out. And so Jackie taught me that she'd say, I love Jesus more than you. And I was like, oh, God, it, Jesus. <laughs> but it really, it's been the source of our love that we love each other more now than ever because Christ is on the throne of both of our lives and we'll make that stand. Or you can put something good. Um, I love fishing. And I have a friend that when he talks about uh, going to heaven, he says, someday I'm going to go fishing because that's what Jesus did after he died and was resurrected, he said, let's go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and had a barbecue, and so fishing is really important to uh, followers of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, Some of you don't like fish, but I do. We love all this about the world, but we're not supposed to love it too much. So if I put on my throne a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, or a football, or even my wife, or my kids, then they think the whole world revolves around them, and it's not good for them. No, it's when we stand up and we say, Christ is first. I love you. It's Christ first, family second. That's the way I can love my family. That's the way I can be strong for my family. That's the way we have it. uh, Never get tired of love for one another and for other people. And it says clearly that God loved the world. That means he loved sinners. It means he loved Um, people with alternative lifestyles. He loved people from every nation and every background, every color of skin, every philosophy. Jesus died for all of them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What a penetrating message Jesus had about his life that John recorded. But we're not supposed to love it too much. So last week I saw um, a podcast which I've been meaning to listen to. I hear it advertised all the time, and I normally listen to all of Brock Heard's podcasts. If you don't know who he was, he was a great quarterback for the University of Washington, for the Seattle Seahawks, and other NFL teams, and he's a sportscaster here in the area. And he has this podcast, which I encourage you to listen to. It's a Christian prod- podcast called Above and Beyond. And he inter- one of, the one that I heard was he interviewed Jake Locker. And that just cut to my heart. I knew about Jake Clare back when he was in high school because his favorite wide receiver was a kid that I dedicated to Christ right here in Rocky Sandusky, and they were best friends and still are best friends. And he was amazing. He was called the savior of the Huskies program because they went 0-10 before he came here. And he was an amazing athlete, incredible speed, size, strength. And if he would have quit after his junior year, which the coach encouraged him to do, He would have been the number one draft pick in the NFL. But he gave up $10 million to stay here with the program to finish his education, and um, he became the eighth pick after his senior year. And so he was sharing his story because it's a big controversy. He went to the NFL, signed with Nashville, um, was very productive as a quarterback, played for four years, and then he left the NFL. 
everyone's like, why does someone leave this multi-million dollar job every year after just four years? And he said to his agent, I don't want to even hear about any offers. He got many, many offers for several years because he had made a choice. That was Christ first, family second. And he had been raised in a family like that. There were a Catholic family up in Ferndale. His dad was a contractor, and he loved being a contractor because he could always be at Jake's events, and he coached him all the way up till he was in high school. And it was always family first in their background, although it wasn't really a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was more just being good people, and he learned a good work ethic. He learned responsibility and honesty, all the things that we love for him as a Husky quarterback and as a Seahawks uh, or a pro quarterback. But there came a time in his life when the pressure was too much. He was called, the, as I said before, the Messiah of the Husky football. That was way too much pressure. And so he drank a little bit, but it got way out of hand. He met a really nice girl that he loved a lot. And um, whenever he would get drunk, she would leave a little note, make sure he got home safe and sound. She would leave a little note and said, here's a list of everything you did because you're not going to remember And then it said, I love you anyway. For him, he said, that was like God's arrow to his heart because it was saying, "Um, I wish you didn't do this. And it said, I love you anyway. And that continued to get worse in the NFL. He couldn't cope with that until they hired a backup for him called Matt Hasselbeck. You know him. He's an outspoken Christian. And so Matt just entered his life and said, like, here's the little brother I never had. And there were very different personalities because Jake was raised in the country, Uh, He loved country music. He loved hunting and fishing and everything else. And Matt didn't like any of that. And so pretty soon he found himself out hunting in Tennessee, duck hunting with Jake. And he was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I hate this. But God gave him a love for Jake and the struggle in his life. Well, finally, he came to a point where he invited him to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes convention down in Orlando. And it was during the off-season. He thought, well, I'll go. That sounds like a great trip to a nice place. And so he and his wife went there. And the very first session of worship, they had a famous rapper lead worship. Now, he was raised on country music. He loved country music, and he hated rap music. And he thought, oh, no, this is going to be a long weekend. And the famous rapper, he doesn't mention who it was in the interview, but he says the famous rapper got up there, and he started to tell his testimony how he was a chameleon around whoever, like whoever he was around. If he was around the bad people, he was bad. If he was around the good people, he was good. And, and he never knew had stability in his life. There was this incredible pressure until he put Christ on the throne of his life. And Jake said, it was like I was the only one in the room. This rapper that I couldn't relate to was telling my story through his story. And God was speaking to his heart. So later they had an altar call. And Jake was the first one up to give his life to Jesus Christ, to have a personal relationship, to put Christ on the throne of his life. For him, in his terms, he said, I moved from being a fan of Jesus Christ to a follower of Jesus Christ. It was no longer a religion. It was a personal relationship that made all the difference for him. And so later that weekend, they went out to the coast um, in Florida there to have a baptism of all the Christian athletes. And the first one baptized was Jake and his beloved wife with Matt Hasselbeck standing right behind him, supporting them. After that, he made the decision to leave pro football. And and Brock says, why did you do it? He says, I was addicted to football. I would put my kids to bed early so I could watch the game on TV. Um, I couldn't pay attention to my wife because I was just thinking football. It was not a healthy thing. I have an addictive personality type. Matt does a great job with it. He said, I just knew that for me, it was the wrong thing to do. All the adoration and everything else was getting to him, all the pressure. And so without telling anyone why he left pro football, you might have heard this, that one of the top upcoming stars in pro football left the game after four years, left a multi-million dollar contract to remodel his grandma's house and to live on the 25 acres there and to uh, raise cattle and chicken and to go to seminary online, which he's still doing right now he wants to be a pastor someday. The world was shocked. No one knew the answer until a Sports Illustrated writer went to interview him up at the uh, Bell's Fair Mall, and he kept prying and prying, and, 
And finally, he said, I didn't run away from football. I ran towards Jesus Christ. So he had the, invited the sports writer to come over to his house with his wife and his newborn baby. And he said, just the way he took my baby in his hands, like a football. And he loved my baby. And he told, and his three kids were just playing all around, tearing up the house. They had a nice uh, uh, breakfast for us. But he said, after I left, I knew that he had not left football. He had gone towards Jesus Christ and his family. And he said, after that, I hugged my kid a little tighter. And I savored my relationship with my wife a little bit more. And I know I have a lot to learn about Christianity. Just for this person that was down to earth, I gave him a bear hug when he came in to have breakfast with him because he had chosen to put Christ on the throne of his life. Now, for me, that was just inspirational. Because those are the same reasons that myself and some of you, we, when we moved towards Christ, it was a dramatic move. For me, I had football on the throne of my life. And I had an encounter with God, and I took it off. It wasn't as famous. I wasn't a multi-million dollar quarterback in the NFL. Um, but it was a dramatic move for me. And I related to every word he said. It just recalled me of the point of putting Christ on the throne of my life which is exactly what John's calling us to do. There's a power in this world, he's saying, that will pull you to become like a chameleon. You'll be different around other people. You'll find yourself saying one thing in one place and another thing in another place, acting one way and acting another way. And every person of every age has to learn that because there's a tug that goes on. I remember when our first daughter, Elise, was born, and um, Jackie was patient with me, becoming good at loving babies. And so she would put me down in front of the TV and turn on Sesame Street and say, I want you to feed Elise while she watches Sesame Street. I'm like, oh, no, not Sesame Street. I can't stand this show. But pretty soon, watching Sesame Street with my daughter, I began to love it. And so finally when she said, I'm not watching Sesame Street anymore, I'm going to watch um, the uh, Barney or so whatever else, I'm like, no, you can't leave Sesame Street. What's Big Bird going to do? What about the count? And it's actually not very um, enticing to people if they find a grown adult watching Sesame Street by themselves. (laughs) But that's how much power my little daughter had over me to influence my world. And so it is with you as a human being. We tend to be influenced by the people that we are around. Now, it doesn't mean we don't love people that are different. We love people that are very different. But they see that we're different, that we're... Just like when I married Jackie, that Christ is on the throne of my life. You aren't. They see that we're different. When I was a football player at Columbia Basin College, um, there's it's a very high competition in junior college. There are people from all the United States there, and and I had a lot of really good friends, and they all smoked dope. And I'd go to their house after practice, and they'd start smoking dope, and they'd say, do you want some? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, well, what do you want? And... I'd say, do you have orange juice? So they started always having orange juice for me uh, when I was there. Because I was making a different stand than they were. I had a different calling than they were. I loved them. I wanted to be their friends. I read about who they're reading. Um, The cornerback on the team became a pro football player. Several of them ended up playing pros. They had the number one team in the nation. And he loved Malcolm X. And so I read Malcolm X so I could talk to him, so I could relate to him. Not that I agreed with him all the time. But I loved him because Christ loves him. But I wasn't willing to follow him in everything that he did. That's such an important trait that every one of us needs to learn and to relearn. And so when I was hearing this interview by uh, Brock Heward, is such a good Christian. I met him once, and he's just outstanding Christian no matter what he does. You can't help but see he's a Christian when he's announcing a game or anything else. Um, He loves Jesus Christ. And he was telling the story along with Jake, and I was just um, blown away. I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old, and I'm still blown away. It wasn't until I was 17 that I made the decision to put Christ on the throne of my life, which dramatically changed my life, changed my calling, changed my time, changed the way I looked at school. But I was remembering all of that and just relating to it so personal, as I want you to do, because I care for you. We can be caught up in this world and we just start doing what everyone's doing and we'll walk right off a cliff if everyone's walking right off the cliff. 
And every one of us has had that challenge. And I know that all of us have had times when we messed up and we go the wrong direction. But the good news is it's time to go the right direction, to put Jesus Christ on the throne of our life. What happens if you have Jesus Christ on the throne of your life? Well, you don't worry as much because you know God wins. He's going to win the Game of Thrones. Whether we like it or not, whether we're for it, whether we understand it, Christ is going to win. So why not join his team now and put him on the throne of your life? Um, We're going to have Jackie lead us in a time of guided prayer.